Good afternoon. I'm Judy Nadler, director and university librarian at the University of Chicago. It is my great pleasure to welcome you, Provost Rosenbaum, distinguished guests, friends of the library, faculty and staff, to this event that celebrates the opening of our new Special Collections Research Center. The beautiful facilities that you will visit today will empower us to better serve our faculty, students, and researchers, and the visiting scholars who come to use the collections from around the world. It is very appropriate that we begin today's program under the iconic dome of the new Joe Enrica Mansueto Library, because the two projects are linked programmatically as well as physically. The construction of the Mansueto Library made it necessary to redo the first floor of special collections because half of the exhibition space and two offices had to be eliminated. We knew that the dynamic exhibition and teaching programs in special collections would be strengthened by new spaces. And we were fortunate to be able to take advantage of the opportunity created by Mansueto to address these needs. With the opening of the Mansueto Grand Reading Room this past Monday, and today's special collections opening, we can begin to understand their interrelationship. Just as Mensuedo enabled the Special Collections Project, the new and renovated Special collection spaces enhance the pathway to Mensuedo. This event marks the beginning of a celebratory period that will culminate with the formal dedication of the Mensuedo Library in the fall. The Joe Enrica Mansueto Library is the library of the future, forward-looking in its programs and respectful of the past. It extends the capacity for serendipitous discovery of our growing physical collections by relieving the open stacks of materials that do not benefit from browsing. And it houses laboratories for conservation and digitization that will ensure their availability over time. Equally important, it provides a unique opportunity to facilitate the discovery of these unique resources through the creation of new spaces for study and research. It is a repository of knowledge and a working laboratory for training present and future generations of scholars. As its name suggests, our Special Collections Research Center is also both a repository and a center that brings students and scholars together with unique and rare materials to, for research and learning. We are entering an era in which libraries are distinguished by the holdings that are unique and special in their collections, rather than by size or commonly held resources. And centers of excellence will be defined by the value we add to these collections by making them visible, interoperable and accessible to all. It is in this environment and recognizing the centrality of special collections to the library's mission to acquire, preserve and disseminate information that the opening of special collections marks an important moment for the library and the university. Alice Schreier, director of Special Collections Resource Center, has been a champion of increased visibility, accessibility, and use of special collections. She and her talented staff have developed innovative instructional programs and pioneered strategies to uncover hidden collections. Alice will share with us her vision of the center in this new environment. Mansueto Library provided an enabling opportunity to add prominence and visibility to the Special Collections Resource Center and to stimulate and enrich, and enrich the research, teaching, and learning experience under its roof. The Special Collections renovation is an achievement, <coughs> sorry, is an achievement that complements and completes the great achievement of the Mansueto Library. Provost Thomas Rosenbaum recognized this opportunity and supported its realization. 
on behalf of current and future users of our extraordinary, special, and unique resources. We thank him for his great foresight. With warmth and great respect, I give you Tom Rosenbaum. Well, it's just a wonderful day uh, to be here and a great honor to celebrate this moment with you. Um, I think only appropriate that after what seems like a month, the sun has finally come out in Chicago as well uh, to grace us uh, with his presence. Um, the special collections and um, this library are really emblematic of what we try to do at the University of Chicago, as uh, Judy was saying. Uh, very forward-looking, but true to our tradition and our past, to our emphasis on uh, intellectual inquiry, investigation, right in the center of campus. And I think just by its presence here and then the combination of a reading room and all the good stuff underneath, which if you haven't seen it already, is well worth uh, looking at uh, five stories down where all the books will be. But the combination of that and the commitment to the preservation and continuing to uncover the secrets of past works is very much reaching across the breadth and values of this institution. Uh, we stand really quite remarkably in uh, contradistinction to a number of our peers, and I think that uh, history will see us wise in that commitment um, and that investment. Um, perhaps uh, most interesting for me, though, was that in this move in the special collection is the discovery of a new manuscript. And um, in this manuscript, it tells uh, about the crisis that hit a battle odd, uh, which was the country where, unfortunately, in almost all the municipalities, the temples moved way out of town. And in fact, it took many days to get your oracles read. Instead, in a particular um, enlightened place, ruled, elliptical place, in fact, ruled by uh, Queen Judith of Cluj, um, there was, in fact, a commitment to building those temples only locally. And in fact, one could come and get your oracle almost immediately, maybe in a minute or two. And what happened, of course, as the manuscript recounts, is that everybody wanted to move to this municipality led by Queen Judith. Her cabinet was filled out by the cabinet ministers of all the other competing cabinets and other municipalities. And in fact, with this investment, one saw the rise or the continued strengthening of this municipality. From there on, it's a little hard to read. There is something in future chapters about Google, I think, something like that. Um, but you will be happy to know that we see in ourselves as well the triumph, if you will, the payoff of this investment in our greatest commodity, which is people. Our ability to recruit people to this campus to get the brightest scholars the most interesting students, the best staff, surrounded not only by the tools to do their business, but by this great beauty. So with those words, I will turn you over first to Alice and then to a real historian, Neil Harris, so you'll be happy to say that, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Provost Rosenbaum. I assure you, you won't find the manuscript he described on uh, Google Books, but um, we're thinking of digitizing it in our new laboratory. Good afternoon, I'm Alice Schreier, director of the Special Collections Research Center. And as Judith Nadler explained, the construction of the Mansueto Library enabled the transformation of special collections that we are celebrating today. Mansueto is indeed magical, but the human vision and tangible support of Judy and Provost Rosenbaum were needed to turn potential into reality, and I extend heartfelt thanks to each of them. Mansueto and Special Collections are connected by much more than a knuckle or a pathway. Mansueto provides essential storage space for continuing to build our collections. 
Over the last decade, we filled all the available storage areas in Regenstein as our annual rate of archival acquisition accessions increased substantially, and we anticipate transferring about one-third of our archival collections into Mansueto in the initial load. Perhaps in 20 years, new collections will arrive chiefly in digital form, but for the foreseeable future, Mansueto thankfully will accommodate the archival, manuscript, and printed materials that we need to continue collecting to support research and teaching, respond to new directions in scholarship, and fulfill our role as cultural stewards and as keepers of the university's historical record. The new conservation and digitization labs in Mansueto are also critical to the mission of special collections. We will now be able to perform treatments that we were previously not able uh, to accomplish, and these treatments will preserve the physical evidence of bindings and other original characteristics essential to book history, and also make it possible to use these fragile materials safely. We now have the space and equipment to digitize unique and scarce printed and archival materials. The library's digitization program improves access to our collections locally and makes them available to researchers worldwide. But those of you who recall the previous route from the front entrance of Regenstein to special collections will understand best the most significant change that we are celebrating today. The special collections exhibition space consisted of dark wood wall cases along a corridor that most people traversed in search of restrooms. The front entrance to special collections was difficult to find and isolated, a barrier even for those who knew we existed. The contrast with our new location on the pathway to Mansueto, Main Street as we call it, and the bright open feel of our new spaces could not be more sharp. This new visibility is both symbolic and strategic. On your way to this grand reading room, you walk past the two most dramatic changes in special collections, and some of you have already had a chance to stop in. The new exhibition gallery and the installation of the R. R. Donnelly lead silhouette printer's marks. The exhibition gallery is already attracting a steady flow of students who are visibly absorbed in what they are viewing. The gallery is also a remarkably flexible space that makes it possible for us to collaborate with students and faculty on innovative exhibition projects. For example, just a couple of months ago when the space had just uh, been finished and not um, uh, occupied, an art history graduate student was awarded an uncommon grant for a wonderfully creative show she was inspired to propose for the new space. Later today, we will learn more about the R. R. Donnelly lead silhouette printer's marks, which were part of the gift of the R. R. Donnelly corporate archive to the University of 2000, in 2005 and 2007. Their beauty and historical significance light the pathway between Mansueto and Regenstein. The changes inside special collections are more subtle, but perhaps even more impressive because of the seamless blending of old and new. An additional group study and an enhanced classroom facilitate new programs and greater interaction between students and special collections materials in classes and groups, and new offices bring staff into close proximity to researchers. During the reception and open house following Neil Harris's talk, you will have a chance to view the stunning inaugural exhibition curated by Daniel Meyer, Associate Director of Special Collections and University Archivist. And I hope you'll come back and spend more time than you'll be able to this afternoon. Firmness, Commodity, and Delight illuminates the history of architectural practice through rare books, manuscripts, archival materials, and other objects from special collections. Dan took the exhibition title from the works of the first century Roman architect Vitruvius Pollio, who identified structural soundness, utility, and visual beauty as the essential components of good architecture. Vitruvius would surely approve of the special collections renovation, which fulfills all these requirements. 
and I am delighted that the Booth Hansen team, Larry Booth, David Mann, Joseph King, and Todd Stevens are here today. Their creativity and expertise gave tangible form to our vision. And we can already see in faculty and student reactions to the spaces, in ideas for innovative exhibition projects and courses, that the new and renovated spaces in special collections will enable new ways of teaching and learning with our magnificent collections. And that, more than anything else, is what we are celebrating today. It's now my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's speaker. Neil Harris is a cultural historian with particular interests in the history of museums and libraries, the social history of art and design, world's fairs, popular entertainment, and the relationship between people and the built landscape. His most recent book is The Chicagoan, a lost magazine of the jazz age, published by the University of Chicago Press, which brought to light a long forgotten magazine Neil discovered while browsing in the Regenstein stacks. How appropriate. Neil is currently working on a history of the National Gallery of Art under director J. Carter Brown. Neil was a member of the Provost Task Force on the University Library appointed by Provost Richard Saller in 2005. The group was charged to consider the, quote, changing uses of our library following the decision to build an addition to Regenstein to house an on-site automated storage and retrieval facility. That is, of course, what is now Mansueto. One of the committee's recommendations was that, quote, the Special Collections Research Center should be made more visible and accessible. Integration of the SCRC exhibition space into the library's broader pedagogical function is important. This recommendation became a priority goal in planning the new spaces. And now that we have accomplished the first spatial part, we are perfectly poised to achieve the programmatic component. Neil's multiple points of intersection with special collections give him unique insight. He teaches courses in our Marie Louise Rosenthal seminar room, and he is a familiar figure as a researcher in the special collections reading room. He is also a very generous donor. Neil's professional papers were transferred to the archives recently, and gifts from the collection of Neil and his wife, Terry Edelstein, have enriched, enriched our collections in graphic design, illustrated books, and children's literature. Neil has been an astute observer of special collections for many years, and we are honored by his willingness to offer reflections on special collections on this occasion. Thank you very much, Alice, for those remarks. Uh, I'm grateful for the invitation to speak today. I guess reflections is appropriate in this space. Um, I uh, begin, uh, however, with uh, some retrospection, which I guess is inevitable for many of us. I vividly recall the opening of Regenstein in the fall of 1970, just a year after my arrival, and what seemed then to be the sparkling new quarters for special collections. That was also a very great moment. These latest changes are exciting and moving to me, and I, of course I congratulate Judy and Alice and um, everyone on the staff for seeing them through. In many ways, I am an artifact of this department. I was created as a book collector by the friendship and example of Bob Rosenthal, its first curator. So these changes mean a great deal to me uh, on several levels of thought and feeling. I am also, I hope, an instance of one of the things this department is meant to do, to create and to nurture friends of the larger library to help it fulfill its broader mission. And that brings me to some brief remarks today. The relationship between university libraries and their special collections has long interested me both as a user and as an historian. It is not quite as uncomplicated as it might seem at first glance. That's a remark that you can hear any faculty member say about any subject uh, in our institution. University libraries did not usually begin with departments of rare books or special collections. They came much later, after these libraries had been operating for decades 
sometimes even for centuries. More than 20 years ago, in a conference devoted to libraries and scholarly communication, I attempted to explain the delay, commenting on a paper which explored the connection. This paper argued that, like other aspects of modern university libraries, rare book and special collections grew from demands made by a professionalized scholarly community. In humanistic disciplines, the expansion of knowledge had proceeded by canonizing a group of important texts. These texts, in their varying states and editions, supported by manuscripts, archives, and correspondence, were central to scholarship, the argument ran, and had, through rarity and desire, become increasingly valuable. So treasure rooms were created to house them, along with special staff supervision and better-than-usual furniture, privileging their status within the larger library in the interest, again, of advancing scholarship. This was a straightforward and appealing explanation, and much evidence supported it. Why shouldn't the special collections and rare book sections of university libraries, in some instances and in later years, given their own buildings and their own names, Houghton, Beinecke, Lilly among them, why shouldn't they have been responses to scholarly demand increasing in scale and number like scholarship itself? In the 1920s and 30s, these treasure rooms, handsomely outfitted with paneled wood, oriental carpets, and carved mottos, sometimes featuring particularly valuable items on permanent display like a Gutenberg Bible, they multiplied in university libraries. One of the earliest, Harvard's treasure room, was set up within the new Widener Library in 1915. Over the next few decades, great religious-like structures were put up on campuses all over America. Sterling Library in New Haven, Firestone at Princeton, and so on, with these humanistic shrines encased within them like lady chapels. Gathering and protecting the original sources necessary for research, particularly manuscript collections, seems in retrospect logical and appropriate. This was the fuel that fed faculty investigation, the inspiration for all sorts of collection gifts and university purchases. But there were several problems to the argument. One I've already mentioned, rare book and special collections departments came to university libraries rather late, most of them in the 30s and subsequently. This was considerably after the growth of American scholarship itself, particularly in the humanities and social sciences. Secondly, by this time, there were hundreds of specialized libraries serving scholars in the United States, some of them going back well into the 19th century. Almost all existed outside universities and were firmly linked to amateur collecting and wealthy patrons. I merely mention the Newbury, the Morgan, the Curar, the Clements, the Huntington, the John Carter Brown, the New York Historical Society, the State Historical Society of Wisconsin, the Chicago Historical, the Lennox, the Astor, the Clark, on and on. A number of these in time would be combined or enclosed within larger institutions, like the New York Public and the UCLA libraries. Others, like the Folger, the Frick Reference Art, Art Reference Library, the Linda Hall in Kansas City, the Hagley in Delaware, would continue to be established in the 30s and thereafter. Used extensively by scholars, many of whom worked in universities, these specialized libraries were stimulated not by them, but by collectors, gatherers, hobbyists, genealogists, who were caught up in some special passion, like Shakespeare in Henry Clay Folger's case, or American history for William Clements. They possessed the means to do something about satisfying their obsessions. So I reasoned, the departments of special collections and rare books came relatively late to university libraries because they were not simply responses to scholarship as such or to the research needs of faculty, but monuments to sympathetic collectors and alumni benefactors, where once many of them would have founded their own libraries or dispersed their holdings at auction 
like Brayton Ives or Robert Ho or George Brinley, increasingly now, they thought of research universities as secure repositories for their special interests, wanting, if they were alumni, to demonstrate their loyalty or hoping to invoke the greatness of specific writers, regions, countries, or events and build upon the prestige of the universities. This is not to deny the tight linkage between special collections and academic scholarship or to argue against the fact that many of these collectors were inspired by college teachers and a desire to encourage faculty research. Certainly they were. But if we are to understand how and why these departments have grown, we must acknowledge other things as well. Personal patronage, university development campaigns, cultivation programs, amateur enthusiasm, charismatic library curators, sudden buying opportunities, and a mass of unpredictable and even arbitrary conjunctions. Departments of special collections, it seems to me, were and remain particularly dependent upon happy accidents, something like museum collections, the children of individual enthusiasms for subjects serious and less serious. In our instance, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas, golf and cookbooks, the history of science, and the history of advertising, English literature, and paper currency. Consider, for example, what special collections holds aside from books and manuscripts. Posters, postcards, broadsides, brochures, maps, wills, trade catalogs, ledgers, theater programs, jewelry, greeting cards, tax records, comic books, valentines, crockery, licenses, badges, uniforms, book plates, printing blocks, cartoons, films, kimonos, and so on. A modern Schatzkammer, testimony to the diversity and voraciousness of human interest, and ultimately to the capacity of scholarship to make use of what has been gathered and presented. Special is an adjective with many synonyms, distinctive, exceptional, memorable, important among them. We can certainly invoke these words for special collections. But one thing that special collections is not, curiously enough, is specialized. Or at least, it is less specialized than the library surrounding it. Opportunistic, to be sure, idiosyncratic, unusual, but also in many ways non-exclusive, unrestricted, unpredictable, even in some of its accumulations, apparently unchecked. Thus, there is something of a paradox surrounding the phrase special collections. From several perspectives, all libraries, save for copyright libraries like the Library of Congress, are in practice special collections, that is, they intentionally gather together subcategories of much larger possibilities. Choice can be a function of budget, intellectual preference, serviceable need, user interest, building size, or some combination. But none of that changes the practicing selectivity that most libraries, including Regenstein, must observe. In its 1979 Collective Development Policy Statement, for example, the University of Chicago Library declared, since the acquisition program for the research collection is virtually limitless, and since unlimited acquisition is obviously not practicable, thoughtful selection is indispensable. The larger library in our case follows scholarly criteria for most fields, although in the case of certain foreign cultures, Southeast Asia, for example, it includes a documentary mode and acknowledges elsewhere in fiction and biography, for example, the fact that even scholars and students sometimes read for pleasure. Bibliographers make choices, and in the end, so does special collections. But as my list of holdings indicated a few minutes ago, the criteria are very different. Special collections is, in all sorts of ways, a reflective archive, documenting amateur passions and obsessions along with scholarly pursuits and scholarly accumulations. It registers the history of the university itself and the disciplines within. It battens off the career trajectories and evolving interests of friends and alumni. 
It provides the raw materials for the often unpredictable course of future investigation. It, far more than its library host, corroborates the fads, fancies, tastes, interests, and values of the larger society constituting a very different kind of treasure trove than the rare book collections that preceded it or the scholarly monographs and serials that surround it. Private obsessions and personal passions then significantly fuel scholarly investigation through the engine of special collections. For our library, these include, among others, the Reverend William Barton, the clergyman and intrepid biographer. He did more than a dozen biographies of Abraham Lincoln, who presented his sources and materials for these studies to the library. Or Joseph Hal Schaffner, the head of a clothing company who got absorbed by the history of science. Or Louis Chatmery, the chef and owner of the bakery, who bequeathed his collection of Hungarica as a reminder of his native country. Lincoln, the history of science, Hungarica, these are well-established categories. But Special Collections also contains canon-challenging materials, neither costly nor especially valued by contemporaries, but promising territory for later researchers. One such group that I find particularly appealing, among many examples, is the Morris Fishbein Collection of Birth Announcements. Dr. Fishbein, whom some of you here may remember, was a prominent Chicago physician he once appeared on the cover of, of Time magazine. He gained fame as the editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association for more than 25 years. He was a tireless crusader against medical quackery, and as a prolific author, he delighted in its exposure. He would also help endow a center for the study of the history of medicine here and a professorship. As a very public figure in Chicago, Dr. Fishbein received hundreds and hundreds of birth announcements over the years. Some of them, I have to say, quite remarkable. Um, even more remarkably, he kept them. <laughs> On the face of it, uh, simply an unusual and curious collection with oddly assorted pieces of information. But in time, it would serve a number of research purposes. One of them was a seminar paper, later published, which studied the dramatic rise of hospital as opposed to home births in early 20th century Chicago. This shift was nationwide, of course, and had a series of causes, but it was especially encouraged by the prominent University of Chicago obstetrician, Joseph de Bolivar Lee, who helped create the Lying In Hospital here in Hyde Park. The announcements documented the popularity of hospital birthings by period as well as the most fashionable locations. They also demonstrated the turn to photography and a taste for physiological detail as part of the expected information. Another use of the collection um, came for me when I was exploring building rituals in the life cycle and turned to these elaborately printed forms to compare them with the ceremonies that surround building openings. Other applications, I'm sure, will come in future. They are hard to anticipate, but the appeal of these assemblies is precisely their unexpected deployment within a range of useful questions. Another figure who may fit this category was Henry Friedman, who gathered about 5,500 illustrated children's books in the 1920s and 30s while he was living in the Standard Club downtown in what I assume must have been crowded quarters. Uh, they are known today as the Encyclopedia Britannica collection. Friedman also collected 19th century American sheet music, which is now at the Newbury. A businessman whose resources were considerably more limited than rival collectors, Friedman apparently longed to buy expensive and early editions of classic works, and he did so in some instances. But his budget forced him into the market for contemporary examples. As a result, he acquired the work of interwar illustrators who are today highly valued, admired, and costly, and who are themselves the subjects of considerable scholarly interest. Picture books are studied by anthropologists, cultural historians, psychologists, art historians, 
and clearly reflect, as well as influence, attitudes about many things, race, gender, work, play, nationalism, machines, manners, and nature. And they reveal, as well, in this period, the cosmopolitanism engendered by European artist emigres in the teens, 20s, and 30s, and broader changes in American taste. Henry Friedman's enthusiasm, as well as his economic constraints, permit us today to examine a significant number of these texts. It must be admitted that despite some spectacular gifts and their attendant publicity, our own library came to appreciate this area somewhat slowly. In his rather impassioned and evangelistic faculty survey of the University of Chicago Libraries, which was completed in 1932, the library director of that day, M. Llewellyn Rainey, concluded that we needed $2.7 million, in today's terms, more than $50 million, just to bring our collections up to par with our academic competitors. Ambitious to rival the monographic and serial holdings of the older university libraries, mainly in the East, Rainey spent no time at all discussing rare books or special collections. But he summarized a faculty report on what were called fugitive materials, things that could not be shelved like books. They recorded, he admitted, personalities and situations not conveyed easily through the printed record and objects epitomizing attitudes and movements. This report, which showed the influence of its chairman, Professor Harold Laswell, a distinguished political scientist and a student of mass communications, spoke about voting machines and death masks, robes, gavels, building models, materials, and I quote, hitherto ignored or regarded as suitable for museums only. Though these reflections did not stimulate new collecting policies, alas, I like the phrase fugitive materials. It captures the protean, hard to describe, but often arresting character of special collections and the highly personal origins of its assets. But I suppose uh, we are not going to be able to create this new department. Like all special collections seems to be divided into three large areas, First, materials reflecting the history of the university, its faculty, and scholarship more generally, and designed to serve such research. Second, those fugitive materials, the collecting passions, some of them quite unexpected, of generations of hunters and gatherers. And third, the aesthetic dimension, the history of printed books and manuscripts valued for beauty, rarity, or documentary interest. This, I confess, is my own enthusiasm, and in an age of virtual communication, should one hopes continue to thrive, stimulated most recently by the enormous Donnelly Company archive. The challenge, especially for the history of printing and the book, is promoting awareness and encouraging contact. There are all sorts of ways of doing so, exhibitions, catalogs, in-house classes, online descriptions, newsletters, conferences, seminars, many of them reaching faculty as well as students. All that is being done. But for me, I confess, the most powerful instrument remains direct examination, physical encounter with the things that are here. And for this, the exhibition is central. Plucking things out, bringing them to light, and organizing them according to special principles. I have learned, of course, much in libraries, but I've learned also a great deal in used bookstores, in book fairs, in postcard bourses, in ephemera societies, because sight, touch, and sometimes smell all play a role in the materials that attract attention. Store shelves and fair booths organize materials according to different logic than library catalogs. They open up the pleasures of unusual juxtaposition. I remember one of Bob Rosenthal's gambits on entering a used bookshop for the first time. He would ask for books published in 1910. The startled proprietor would usually explain that he employed categories other than publication date as his basis for organization. Bob would express surprise at this, and lively conversation followed. 
Similarly, Special Collections, while it uses Library of Congress numbers for printed books, also groups them by collection category and donor name, letting a reader or a, re or a researcher retrieve the process through which the collector gathered her sources, another way of making discoveries. The lack of easy physical accessibility, of casual visibility, constitutes the great obstacle blocking broader knowledge and exploitation of what Special Collections contains. For obvious reasons, its stacks are not available to browsers. Security, safety, fragility militate against it. But closed stacks reduce the pleasure and serendipity of investigation as much as the open stacks of the larger library invite, acknowledge them. There are all ways around this. Here in Special Collections, under staff supervision, whole categories can temporarily be assembled and studied and customized for individual need. It was precisely my browsing through the training department library, which was given to us and the Newbury by the Donnelly Company, that launched my own collecting and interest in printing history, this more than 30 years ago. It was the freedom to examine hundreds of examples of fine printing that had been gathered for Donnelly employees to inspect a sort of permanent exhibition for them in the 1920s and 30s. It was the opportunity to survey these things that made them so meaningful. Without seeing the materials, which eventually would be divided between uh, Regenstein, Special Collections, and the Newbury, they were just titles without much meaning. Among other things, it inspired me to co start collecting paper sample books an invaluable source for the history of American commercial art, and it ultimately led me to prepare a course on that subject. I don't think I had known before just what a paper sample book was or how closely linked this genre was to the history of American commercial design. Digitizing brings these things closer, certainly. Web images put up by museums, libraries, and booksellers help enormously. I browse them on a daily basis. In fact, art museums for so long without indices to their collections have now moved ahead of many libraries in providing annotated entry, offering images, provenance information, exhibition history, and bibliographical reference with a few simple keystrokes. Their task is easier because their central collections in painting and sculpture are smaller than a great library's. But there are already signs of progress in our electronic catalog, and I hope that future library cataloging, especially descriptions for special collections materials, will include visual sampling to entice the unwary and draw them in further. But not, again, as a substitute for actual contact. This will come for many, as it has before, first through the exhibition galleries, exposing for limited periods of time some of what the necessarily closed stacks contain. Of course, exhibitions do more than simply display. They not only present samples, but integrate them within arguments and revise narratives. And they encourage moves to the reading room for further engagement. They also demonstrate the significance of material presence, which are a virtual resource, and Google, of course, is the great symbol here, have been threatening, apparently, with extinction. And as I close, let me turn briefly to this last issue, the relationship of special collections to the larger crisis of the text. For the last three or four decades, a specter has been haunting many scholars and librarians, the terrifying prospect of forfeiting the central role played by printed books and manuscripts in our professional lives. A series of impassioned and closely argued books, essays, speeches, and manifestos have appeared, denying or decrying the imminent death of the printed word and proclaiming the continuing need, at least by certain kinds of specialists, for unmediated access to original sources and by most others to print and writing. These commentaries, often by distinguished humanists, have varied in persuasiveness some primarily confessions of faith and exercises in evocation, others more analytically presenting the reasons why direct contact with books 
will remain significant for some time in the future. There has been mingled with this, of course, exhilaration over the possibilities that digitized access offer scholars, liberation from geographical constraint, the electronic bounty this new age has brought. But despite this, there is a sense of nervousness and uncertainty that hovers over even the optimism. This painful reappraisal, ironically enough, takes place at a time when printing, reading, and the book as objects of serious, sustained study themselves, as subjects for historical inquiry, are barely more than a generation old. Lucien Febvre, Henri Martin, Elizabeth Eisenstein, among the initiators of this realm, are scholars of recent memory. It is not difficult to recall 30 years ago the excited response to their work and the work of others just starting. The effort to come to terms with the Gutenberg Revolution to debate its social, economic, cultural, and intellectual impact is by common standards relatively new. The Hegelian notion that Minerva's owl flies only in the gathering dusk, that we gain wisdom only as it is overtaken and overrun by events, could scarcely seem to find a better illustration. I bring this up as I end because Special Collections promises to be, with its walls and cases of glass, a new chamber of transparency connecting the age of the printed book with the new age of our students, who already seem to inhabit a radically different sensorium. The physical future of libraries, of research libraries, is less transparent. Forty years ago, three huge university libraries were being completed in the Chicago area, their capacities exceeding 10 million volumes. Today, Mansueto and the room we sit in may well be the last major library edition many of us will see. In all its magnificence with its preservation areas and its sunken stacks, it is simultaneously conservatory, hospital, warehouse, sheltering and repairing a considerable inheritance that will be immediately accessible, but only virtually browsable. This inheritance will be growing considerably in coming decades. Increasingly, serendipity will have to take different forms. Crucial to this process will be the enticement, the information, and the instruction provided by the exhibitions and the courses in special collections. Much will depend on how this department defines and fulfills its mission. Once a postscript, an afterthought, an add-on, a latecomer to the university library, Special Collections now faces the challenge of serving as its mainstay, a link between research and an eclectic mass of materials that connect scholars, students, amateur enthusiasts, collectors, hoarders, and corporate chroniclers. We can all look forward, I'm sure, to its shouldering this mission with the intelligence and the imagination that it has demonstrated in the past and doing so in its wonderful new setting for teaching, exhibition, and contemplation. Thank you very much.